Welcome to another safety class and today we're going to start talking about subpart P which is excavations. Definitely excavations take place on most construction sites and this is one of the most hazardous areas and that's why uh, OSHA has designated uh, excavations as one of the, fo the focus four areas of inspections which has the hazard of caving ins or uh, being uh, uh, stranded in a ditch for example with the sides of the ditch collapsing and so on so caught in between which is one of the focus four applies particularly to excavations and ditches so today we're going to learn about what are the safe practices when doing excavation and what are the different types of soils that we're going to be exposed to and what kind of precautions have to be taken with these different types of soils some of the most frequently cited violations when it comes to um, excavation are the protection from cave-ins, which is the, the focus of, of, the, uh, of the issue here, means of egress provided, which is how to get out of the trench in case cave-ins start to happen, daily inspections by a competent person, we're going to learn what's a competent person, and why do we have to perform daily inspections, because weather conditions might change, there might be freezing and thawing, or there might be some rain, which would loosen the soil and make it more susceptible to cave-ins and collapse, protection from things falling into the excavation, if you have equipment at the side of the excavation, or if you have labor standing at the edge of the excavation, there's a fall issue here, and a competent person inspection, employees removed from hazard. Again, these are the most frequently cited uh, issues when it comes to excavation, and we can see these in our code book. First of all, a quick uh, refresher on what you have learned in your soils class or what you're going to learn in the soils class. Uh, to think, to know exactly what's the magnitude of hazard when it comes to excavation. The density of dry soil is 85 pounds per cubic foot. Once it gets wet with water filling the voids of that soil, it becomes heavier. So it becomes, the weight becomes around 120 pounds per cubic foot. So if you are standing in a trench that's 10 foot deep, a 10 foot column of dirt could weigh up to 1,200 pounds. So imagine if 1,200 pounds collapse on a person that can easily kill that person. That's why the big hazard when it comes to excavation. So how do these cave-ins happen? Basically, the hazard is unsupported excavations can slide into the hole. There's going to be lack of friction, so there's, these are going to uh, slide the layers of the soil are going to slide on top of another layer and it's going to fill that void so this is basically what's going to be the big hazard there another hazard is what's called boiling water rising up or boiling from the bottom of the trench which can undermine the stability of the surrounding soil again if you have granular soil like sandy soil for example with upward water pressure that can definitely cause that boiling and can cause the collapse of that soil. That's another big hazard. That's why water in ditches or in excavation is a very risky issue. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. The third hazard is heaving, which is a downward pressure of adjoining soil which pushes the trench bottom upwards. So the weight of the wet soil masses basically pushes the bottom upwards and that causes also a collapse and this particularly happens in wet clay soil where you have the particles very close together and uh, they're going to form lumps and that can cause this heaving. So today we're going to talk about a competent person. What is a competent person? OSHA has three definitions. In fact, it has a definition for something called an authorized person, a qualified person and a competent person. And I'm going to read from the OSHA definition here. An authorized person is a person who is authorized by the employer to perform a task. So any laborer, for example, working inside a trench, in this case is going to be an authorized person because they have been authorized to work inside the trench. However, there's another layer which is called a qualified person. A qualified person is a person who has the knowledge to perform that task through education, schooling, training, or experience. So that's a higher level than authorized person. And then the highest level is going to be the competent person, which is going to be, by the way, 
and a qualified person working in a trench must be authorized as well. Now, a competent person is going to be qualified and authorized at the same time, but a little bit more. So a competent person is a person who is qualified and authorized to perform the task, and a competent person must have, and this is the most important part here, must have the ability to identify hazardous conditions and have the authority to take action to maintain this, the uh, a safe workplace or to prompt the corrective measures. So the two major conditions for a competent person above and beyond being qualified and being authorized is they can identify the hazard and they have the authority to take prompt corrective measures. When it comes to uh, an excavation competent person, and later on, by the way, we're going to see in other different trades when it comes to safety, a competent person in excavation might not be a competent person in electrical, for example. So each trade, each discipline has its own competency level and its own competency training. So a competent person in excavation is trained in soils, recognizing the different types of soil and being able to analyze that soil. In protective systems, what kind of protective systems are we going to use? Are we going to use uh, benching? Are we going to use sloping? Are we going to use trench boxes? What are different types and what's the proper use, how to use them properly? Hazard recognition, including hazardous atmospheres, especially when you dig, again, when you work inside trenches, you might have some gases, for example, methane, for example, or something like that, that might be toxic. For, especially with the long exposure. So again, hazard recognition is definitely a skill needed in a competent person. Knows when to call a PE for help. PE stands for professional engineer. Usually it's going to be a geotechnical engineer or an engineer specialized in soil analysis and soil design and things like that. Especially if the excavation is going to exceed 20 feet. In this case, you must have a certification from a PE to allow you to work inside that trench. So knows when to call a PE for help if the soil conditions change, if we fear that there might be some uh, cave-in or might, might cause some collapse, then we have to call a PE to suggest a corrective action. And knowledge of subpart P, which is what we're talking about here, which is soils, or excavations through soils. We have to inspect equipment daily by a competent person. Equipment might be something like uh, a trench box, for example, which is going to be used to support the sides of the excavation. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. So you're going to inspect several times prior to work starting, because again, overnight there might be some conditions that changed the site uh, specifics. As needed throughout the shift, again, if you had heavy rain or heavy snow during the day, then that might change the conditions as well. After rainstorms and uh, after other hazards, hazard increasing events. If, for example, there was a minor earthquake or a tremor that might destabilize the soil, if there were heavy equipment passing by that might destabilize the soil, all of these are different conditions that require an additional inspection by a competent person. Some of the hazards related to excavation include surface encumbrances, existing buildings, equipment, spoils or piles of soil uh, resulting from other excavation, things like that. Underground utilities. Of course, when we excavate through a site, we might face older utility pipes or cables or conduits or something like that. So these, some of these cables might be still live. Some of these uh, water pipes might be covered in asbestos, for example, which is now a, a hazardous material. So we have to recognize all of these. Spoiled piles, again, resulting from previous excavation, as we said. Operating equipment too close to trench, which might destabilize that trench. If you have heavy equipment operating close by, they might destabilize it. Access and egress to and from the trench. How are we going to get to the bottom of the trench and how are we going to get out if we need to get to or when we need to get to? There are going to be, for example, slopes or there are going to be ladders that enable us to do so. Excavating near operating roads where you have constant traffic and that constant traffic again with the vibrations is going to cause destabilization to the soil. And watch the load and stand away. Again, if you're operating equipment close by, watch the load from that equipment because the load is transferred in a uh, sloping line as you're going to learn through soils. So stand away a certain distance to try to avoid the destabilization of the soil. 
hazardous atmospheres. So maybe in some cases, if someone is working inside a trench, you're going to provide a lifeline, which is a form of personal protective equipment. So even if that person loses consciousness, then uh, you can pull them out of that trench. Water in the ditch, as we mentioned always, water in the ditch is a very hazardous issue, especially if you're going to be operating electrical equipment inside that ditch as well. Water and electricity are always a bad combination. Fall protection from the people outside of that trench, they might fall in the trench. Cave-in protection, we're going to talk about different types of soil. We classify them under OSHA standards as type A, type B, and type C. We're going to talk about these in more details. Allowable side slopes, we're going to learn about these. And the use of trench boxes, how should they be installed, we're going to talk about that as well. As we just mentioned, deep excavations require a PE design. What's the definition of a deep excavation? Any excavation 20 feet or more. Protective systems, uh, if not installed properly, that might cause a hazard by itself. So they have to be installed in the proper way. Surface encumbrances include telephone, utility poles, sidewalks, buildings, roadways, etc. They must be supported or removed if they pose a hazard to employees. It happens sometimes when you excavate, especially for mass excavation and deep excavation, that you might find that the adjacent buildings or structures are starting to crack or tilt or even in excess excessive cases collapse. Why? Because the stress distribution goes in something called the stress bulb which goes as a, at a something like a 45 degree angle. So even if you're not digging directly underneath the building, the stress coming from the foundations of the building exists in the soil that you have removed. So by removing that soil, this building, the load from the building is not distributed properly anymore. So that causes the building to lean or even to collapse. So this is definitely a danger. That's why you have to support the sides of the excavation to carry the load from the adjacent building. Structures must be supported if near the excavation, and excavations must not undermine sidewalks unless properly supported. So we're going to provide the proper support, whether it's in the form of sheet piles, for example. That's one of the common ways of supporting the excavation. Undercutting existing foundations do not excavate below existing footings of, or of structures unless Either a support system has been provided or excavation is in stable rock where the load distribution is vertical or you have a PE, professional engineer, approving that excavation because they would know exactly how the stress is distributed and whether it's safe or unsafe to excavate under these foundations. In case of underground utilities, you must locate all underground utilities. They might exist from existing maps, that you might find them through existing maps, old maps of that uh, site, or you call the utility company if they have any knowledge about these, uh, the routes of these different cables, pipes, etc. So prior to any excavation, you have to locate the underground utilities, and the underground utilities must be protected, either supported, removed, or guarded, while the excavation is open if they are still active so that they would not interfere with the excavation uh, operations. Call before you dig. There's usually a, an 800 number. In case you are doubting whether there are, there are uh, utilities or not, call that number and they're going to give you some, um, some information. So contact utility company locator prior to excavating. If no response within 24 hours, if you don't get an immediate resp response from them, or if they cannot establish utility location, if they don't have existing maps, then the employer may proceed with caution because you may find, you may hit a cable, especially if it's a live cable that can cause electrocution. Employer must use detection equipment or other acceptable means used to locate utilities. Now we have a new technology, relatively new. It's been around for the past maybe 10 years or so, which is called GPR. GPR stands for Ground Penetrating Radar that enables you by sending radar waves, ultrasound waves, it enables you to draw a 3D, to get a 3D view of what's embedded underneath 
your soil before digging. So it would show you there are pipes or there are cables and what are their directions and what are their volumes, etc. So you'd know before excavation where these exist and you can either avoid them or deactivate them before uh, the excavation. Loose material is always a hazard. So protect workers from loose material that may fall from the excavation phase. How do you do that? Again, we're going to talk about either sloping or benching and what is the safe distance to keep away from the edge of the excavation and the use of trench boxes as well. So spoil piles must be at least two feet from the excavation and or use retaining devices to prevent material from rolling into excavation. Again, one of these retaining devices is what's called sheet piles. In case you haven't seen sheet piles, they are something like a uh, C-section steel uh, element that's driven vertically in the soil and that's going to take the lateral load of that soil so that the, the, the excavation doesn't cave in. And that's usually used in uh, deep excavation. Keep equipment away from the edge of excavation because, again, if they get too close to the side, they might destabilize the soil and fall into that trench. So the minimum distance is going to be two feet. And here's a graph showing, for example, if this is a uh, backhoe uh, or an excavator at, at the edge of the excavation, uh, the spoiled pile must be at least two feet from the edge and material storage and equipment must be at least two feet from the edge. So the minimum safe distance is going to be two feet from the top of the edge of the excavation, as you can see here. Now we, have, we can see that it's sloped and that sloping follows what's called the angle of repose of the soil, which is a natural angle that the soil forms if uh, left naturally without any external support. That would be a safe way to support that soil. Operating equipment too close, hazard of operating equipment too close to excavations, you have to watch for vibrations. Clear view to the rear, especially if that equipment is backing up. So if it's backing up, you, you must have somewhat a monitor or you, have, ha, you must have some mirrors or any way to know whether you're too close to the edge of the excavation or not. And the moisture content of the soil, again, that can change the characteristics of the soil, making it more collapsible. So use barricades or other warning systems. Either you're going to have cones or barricades or you're going to have a flagger, someone with a flag who's going to notify the equipment operator, stop, you're getting too close to the edge of the excavation. Access and egress. Remember these numbers here. Trenches four feet or deeper must have a means of egress, ladders, stairways, ramps, or others. Travel distance, the maximum travel distance that the person inside the ditch or the trench has to move to get out of the trench, to get to an egress or, or access uh, means, like a ladder, is 25 feet. No more than 25 feet. Quick question here. If we have a trench that's 49 feet long, okay, how many ladders do we need for that trench? Think for a second, how many ladders? Remember, the maximum distance is 25 feet. So the trench is 49 feet long. How many ladders do we need? Some of you may have said two, some of you may have said three. The correct answer is one. Why is it one? If you locate that ladder in exactly in the middle, from the farthest point on either side, the distance is going to be 24 and a half feet, which satisfies the code. You would like maybe to have some redundancy so that people are not rushing to get out of the trench. So you may say, okay, I'm going to install two, but by the code, you're going to be fine. You're not going to be violated if you install only one ladder for that 49 foot trench. But remember, the maximum horizontal distance that people have to travel is 25 feet. So the two numbers that you have to remember from the slide is for trenches four, deep, four feet or deeper, if the trench is less than four feet, you don't need that because they can jump, jump over the side of the trench, and the 25 feet to horizontal distance. When it comes to loads, stand away from overhead loads, whether they are buckets, clamshells, or other, from equipment excavating that soil. The haul truck operators may remain in the cab 
for overhead protection during loading. So if they are in the cab, they are already protected by the roof of that cab. Stand away from vehicles being loaded because, again, sometimes the, the, the operator might not pay attention and a person might get hit by that equipment. Hazardous atmospheres. Check excavation for hazardous atmospheres, methane or other gases, uh, sulfur dioxide, or oxygen deficiencies. Again, if there's not enough oxygen getting inside that uh, trench where these conditions might exist, again, use a sniffer to do this. There's a mechanical uh, sniffer that's a device that determines and measures the oxygen content and analyzes the gases inside the trench to decide whether they are, there are any noxious gases or poisonous gases and things like that. And you have to have proper uh, aeration or ventilation of the trench in this case. Rescue equipment is going to be needed if hazardous atmospheres exist. So if someone is going to be working in a, in a trench that has this hazardous atmosphere, you might need a breathing apparatus so that they do not directly breathe the air inside the trench, which is poisonous or hazardous, and a safety harness and line. Again, if something happens and they cannot move on their own, you can pull them out. And a basket stretcher. So if someone is totally uh, out of it and you cannot bring them out, you're going to load them on a stretcher and you're going to lift that stretcher out of the trench to save them. Lifelines in deep and or confined space excavations. We have a special lecture on confined spaces, so we're going to learn later on what's a confined space and what are the conditions of working in a confined space. Employees must wear a harness with lifeline attached. Again, because if they cannot rescue themselves, then someone else can rescue them. The lifeline must be separate from any other line so that it doesn't get entangled with any other line and it must be individually attended at all times when employee is in the excavation so we're going to have an attendant waiting outside doing nothing but watching the people inside the excavation and monitoring their performance and keeping a voice contact and or an eye contact with them to notice any change in their conditions which might necessitate taking them out of the excavation Water in a ditch. As we mentioned before, water in a ditch is not good. We try to avoid that as much as possible. So do not work in excavations that contain water unless special precautions are taken. What kind of precautions are we talking about? First of which is going to be dewatering. We're going to try to suck this water out by dewatering through a, uh, a well point system or a sump pump or something like that. Special shielding. So again, Water is going to destabilize the soil, so we might require special sheathing. And third, use of the harness and lifeline, just in case there's a cave in, then you can extract these workers out. Dewatering operations, if used, must be continually monitored by a competent person, because again, if it's going to be a sump pump, for example, when that sump pump stops, water is going to start accumulating again. So we want to keep a constant watch on the sump pump. Same thing for a well point system. Again, it keeps absorbing this water and expelling it out. So you want to make sure that it keeps working continuously so that water does not accumulate. Fall protection. Walkways over excavation six foot deep or more must have guardrails where employees or equipment cross over excavations. If you're going to have something like a bridge over the excavation and the excavation is six foot deep or more, then you must have the proper guardrails as we're going to learn about them in fall protection. They have special uh, specifications that we're going to learn about. So you must install these guardrails to prevent people or equipment from falling into the excavation or something falling on top of the people who are working inside the trench. The cave-in protection is required except when. So the only cases when you do not need cave-in protection is excavation is entirely in stable rock. What is stable rock? We're going to talk about that. Or the other case where you do not need cave-in protection is if the excavation is less than five foot deep and has been inspected by a competent person who says it is safe to work inside that trench and it does not require cave-in protection. What is stable rock? Again, stable rock is non-fissured rock, solid rock with no cracks in it. 
So note, if blasting was done, if the method of excavation into that rock was blasting, blasting by default is going to create cracks in the remaining rock that has not been excavated. So now it is not stable rock anymore because it has fissures or cracks, so it does not become a stable rock, so it must require some side protection. Rock with sand seams is not stable rock either. So if you find some sand seams inside the rock which are basically filling these fissures or these cracks, it is not stable rock anymore. What kind of protective systems are we going to use? We're going to need side slopes. The steepest, the steepest is going to be 1.5 to 1, which is rise over run. Slope or bench per soil type and application, like uh, for example, we're going to look at type B of soils. Shoring systems, like trench boxes, etc. Timber or hydraulic shoring for uh, as, as for per appendices C and D, as we're going to see in the book. And it's designed, has to be designed by a professional engineer. So these are basically the uh, some of the protective systems that we're going to use into excavation. So when we talk about the different types of soil A, B, and C, we have either rock, stable rock, which is non-fissured rock, which does not require any uh, lateral support, or if it's not fissured rock, if it's not stable rock, then it's going to be either type A, B, or C, and we're going to see what what kind of precautions do we need to make. Soil classifications, how are we going to classify the soil? It must be made on the basis of at least one visual and one manual test. This is something that you have to remember very carefully. What You're going to need two different tests to classify the soil, one visual and one manual. The visual tests include the particle size, which, size which, you can use, which you can visually inspect, spalling and fissures, cracks and scaling, and water presence. You can see clearly with your naked eye whether there's water inside the trench or not. So these are visual tests. The other types of tests which include the manual tests which are the pocket penetrometer test, the raw test for cohesiveness, this is something that you're going to learn about in soils, and the sedimentation test. So these are manual tests. So again, we're going to need at least one visual and one manual test to classify the soil. For soil testing, never enter an excavation to get a soil sample because, again, if you don't know what kind of soil it is, you don't know what kind of support it's going to need, so do not enter. You're going to use some device to extract that soil. Watch how the freshly excavated soil falls from the bucket in the next two slides. Does the soil stick together in large cohesive clumps or does it fall apart like granular soil? So if you hold a handful of soil and let it fall naturally, is it going to form a cone, like in, in case of sand, granular soil, and that cone is going to follow that angle of repose, or is going to fall in chunks or in clumps if it's sticky soil with the particles sticking together? So the first type, is, which is type A soil, this is the best after stable rock. So when we classify the soil, uh, depending on how good the soil is for the purpose of excavation and the minimum amount of required support. The best one is going to be stable rock, which does not require any lateral support. The next one is going to be type A soil, which is generally a clay soil where the soil particles are going to be sticking together, which is a cohesive, cohesive soil sticks together. You can't make mud without clay. So in this, in this case, that's basically what mud is. It has an unconfined compressive strength of 1.5 tons per square foot or greater. So that's a mechanical test that you, you can perform on the soil, which is the unconfined compressive strength. It includes clay, silty clay, or cemented soils. These are different types of soils that you can read about in the soils report. Clay, silty clay, or cemented soil. So that's going to be the type A soil. Okay, how are we going to work in type A soil? Soil is not type A if it is unstable dry rock. It is not type A anymore. If it has been previously disturbed, this is not type A. If it's fissured, it's not type A. And if it's subject to vibration, it is not type A anymore. So again, in this case, it might be either B or C. 
in case of type A soil and again here if we have 20 foot maximum because beyond that you're gonna need a PE uh, you're gonna have the soil self support through the slope of three quarters to one three quarters horizontal to one vertical so the angle here is gonna be more than 45 degrees the soil can support itself in this case another option is benching so you can do the benching and the benching is gonna be maximum four feet horizontal and maximum five feet vertical again the maximum depth is going to be 20 feet beyond that you're going to need the professional engineers um, uh, review and again the average slope of this benching is going to be three quarters to one as you can see or you can use a trench box again with the trench box so you're going to have part part of it is going to be sloped and the other part is going to be vertical with the use of a trench box inside this area and again the maximum depth is going to be 20 feet and the trench box is going to be uh, at least 18 inches above the edge of the excavation in this case so we learned about three different methods sloping benching and sloping with a trench box type b soil now we're moving to a a little bit worse type of soil it has some cohesive properties remember type A was a cohesive soil this one has some cohesive properties it sticks together but not as type A and it has an unconfined compressive strength less than 1.5 tons per square foot which was type A and greater than 0.5 tons per square foot which would make it type C if it, if it has only that it includes silt silt loam or sandy loam or unstable dry rock remember unstable dry rock could not be considered as type a now it can be considered type b or it could be a type a soil like a cohesive soil but fissured or subject to vibrations remember we mentioned that a cannot be fissured or subject to vibration or type a that has been previously disturbed again we mentioned a cannot be previously disturbed so if it has some of these defects it's downgraded from A to B. For B now, the slope is going to be slightly different. It's going to be 1 to 1. So this angle is going to be 45 degrees. And again, maximum 20 feet depth. If it's going to be benched, then it's going to be 4 horizontal, 4, four vertical, 4 horizontal, 4 vertical, maximum 20 feet, again, keeping the angle at 45 degrees or 1 to 1 slope. And if you're going to use trench boxes, Again, it's going to be the same thing. It's going to be like A, but with the slope of 1 to 1. Type C soil, which is the third type, the worst type, basically, is still a cohesive soil, sticks together, has an unconfined compressive strength of less than tons, uh, 0.5 tons per square foot, or if it's a granular soil, like sand, it includes gravel, sand, and loamy sand. What are the precautions in this case? The type C, it must be type C if submerged soil or soil from which water is weeping. So when, when you have water in that soil, high water table, then it's going to be C. Or unstable submerged rock. Unstable submerged rock, which means fissure rock that has been, uh, that has had, uh, that has been submerged. In this case, the slope is going to be twice that of type A one and a half horizontal to one vertical this is going to be type c and with maximum depth of 20 feet and again if you're going to use a trench box it's going to be again 18 inches minimum above the edge of the excavation with a slope of one and a half to one one and a half horizontal to one vertical so double the slope of uh, double or half depending on how you measure it whether rise over run or horizontal versus vertical all excavations over 20 feet deep as we already agreed before must be designed by a registered pro uh, professional engineer in this case it's going to be a geotechnical engineer specialized in soil analysis and soil design the protective systems the trench boxes must be free of damage of, or defects so they're going to be inspected before the installation 
they have to be examined by a competent person to make sure that they fit the the purpose for which they are, they are installed and used per manufacturer's recommendations so each manufacturer manufacturer of trench bots is going to have a design manual how to install them how to maintain them and so on and so forth how to stack them if you're going to stack them you have to follow the manufacturer's recommendations so in trench boxes again the maximum space between the bottom of the uh, the trench box and uh, the of the excavation and the trench box is going to be two feet and here we have the minimum is going to be it's not maximum it's minimum this is a typo the minimum uh, height difference between the edge of the trench box and the edge of the excavation is going to be 18 inches no employees should be standing inside while installing the trench boxes they're going to be installed mechanically by a, by a piece of equipment employees are not allowed in shields when installed moved or removed because the soil why are we installing these trench boxes in the first place because the soil is unstable so if you allow someone to be standing inside the trench while the soil is unstable it can cave in at that time do not over excavate a round box that's another issue do not leave a big distance between the, the edge of the box or the wall of the box and the edge of the excavation because it might cause uh, sudden lateral loads to be applied and someone might be caught in between the trench box and the wall of the excavations again we are going to need ladders for access and egress it must be within the shield system again the distance is going to be no more than 25 feet apart now we have reached the final part of this presentation and we're going to have a quick review over what we have gone over ladders or other means of access are required at what depth in a trench remember where remember on that slide where we had two numbers we had four feet of depth and we had 25 feet of distance so the answer to the first question is four feet how far back from the edge of the trench must spoil piles be whether it's spoil piles or equipment that's going to be operating the minimum safe distance is going to be two feet what two types of tests must be done to classify soils we mentioned that we're going to have two groups of tests. We must have one of each group, which is a visual test and a manual test. At what depth must trenches be either sloped or shored? At what depth must trenches be either sloped or shored? Five feet at least, anything above five feet, and a competent person judges that there's no danger. How often must the excavation competent person ex inspect trenches? Remember, we talked about that with the different conditions that might affect the uh, situation inside the trench. It must be inspected daily, at the shift start, and during the shift, and uh, at other times when the conditions might change, after rainstorms, for example, or uh, earthquakes, or if heavy equipment is operating close by, and so on. So this is our review of sub subpart P related to excavation. Again, remember that this is one of the focus four, and we have to be very cautious when we're working near or inside ditches or trenches. I hope you have learned about this subpart, and I'll be glad to receive any of your questions online.